Lotus. That's actually sick. It's a really nice stra stretch up there. Oh. What's uh, the clavicle? The clavicle insertion. No one's even going to notice. I guarantee you not one of these people are going to notice. I'm not tensing my arms. No one's even going to notice. They're just going to be super. No, that's what Owen. No one's no one's even noticed yet. There's two people here and they haven't even noticed. Let me turn off Jessica. And, okay, no one's even noticed. Oh, and your arms look so big. I'm not even tensing. Your shoulders look so capped and round off. No one's even noticed. I look so tiny next to you. Yeah, you always look tiny next to me. No one's noticed. There's five people here. They still haven't noticed. They haven't even I think I'm noticed pass. what? I'm gonna pass out soon. How do I get to be don't? <sighs> <sighs> So today's actually an intervention not to spring this in Dara, but for his addiction to feed pigs. <laughs> People would get a shock if they saw my feet. Yeah, violently ill if yeah. they saw your foot. Yeah, my feet are not for public consumption. <clears throat> Everyone's here. How are we getting on? It would be so beneficial if you liked this live stream, because if a load of people like it, then youtube were like oh my god the lads are on a live stream that everyone likes and the faster you like it and then they pop it up to more people you know the faster you like it as soon as you click on the more way uh, youtube yeah. are like oh my god yeah um aj oh. jasper somebody whose name i can't pronounce because it's in different letters everyone said hi they're all here aj said how do i get so toned clen and yeah Stuart said, did I, did I want to get a haircut? No. He got a few of them cut? I, yeah, I got a haircut. Darren didn't even notice. Though, so it's not a big deal. Did you get a haircut? <laughs> no. Are you joking? When? This morning. No way. Yeah. Stuart's a nicer, nicer guy than you were. Dick. I Sorry. always notice when you get haircuts. Yeah, because my hair is usually homeless state. And then I get a haircut. <laughs> Best training hall ever, both competition and training... So training national center. I'm going to say South Korea because that's the favorite one I've ever been in, which was amazing. Yeah, it was insane. Best competition training hall. The one where Clockoff did the pause 200 kilo snatch. Clockoff Anaheim this 2015. Clock off that. I think it is that training hall. Yeah, should he have been left into that training hall? Yes, is the question. Is the question we all really are wondering. He's trying to grow the sport of weightlifting, and you're here being so negative. Oh, he's growing the sport oh. of something in weightlifting. Am I right, guys? No. Be, to be fair, I think 2014. Actually, they're all great. They're all fantastic. Saudi Arabia looked pretty good last year for worlds. It looked pretty swanky. Yeah. Uh, is this the industrial I mean, fridge decadence afternoon? Oh, I've gone crazy. Galloping the champs just saved my arse. Did he win the gold cup? What's that? Cheltenham is on this week. Oh, the big race today. Did he win the gold cup? Is that has that happened yet? Uh, Henny Visser says Swoline. Swoline. AM says thoughts on L Thionine. You did some looking into L Thionine, didn't you? Thionine. L Thionine. Yeah, L Thionine is pretty interesting. It's. Um, something we thought about adding to Seek Asleep and maybe in the future, Altini is pretty interesting. Uh, if you've trouble relaxing, I know some people take it with coffee to try and even out the buzz from coffee or people actually take lion's mane with coffee as well, try and get a smoother buzz. I find there's other things that are a bit more effective than coffee for buzzes. But in terms of Altini, it would depend. So anytime you look at any supplements, any concentrated supplement, any nootropic, any pharmaceutical drug, whatever it is, you're always thinking, not what can it just do for anything. You're thinking, what are my needs and what fits that need, you know? So sometimes you'll come across something and it'll be like, oh, this is really useful for staying awake or something. And you're like, oh, that actually is something I need to deal with. But generally think, what is my problem? Do I need better sleep? Do I need to be fresher after training for work? Do I need to hydrate better? Do I need to stop getting cramps? Whatever it is, and then think, go look at what are the options. So, in terms of teening, like, do you need, do you need to relax more after a long days work? Then it might be great, but it, you know, it might do absolutely nothing for you. So, my thoughts on teening are it kind of like everything, it does a job, and it it what matters is what does your job need? Like, what are your needs for that thing? You know, so teening 
is usually a relaxant or it seems to help people relax a little bit more. One thing I would be careful of is anytime you're looking at anything like this is, for example, if you go look at Reddit nootropics and you looked at all the topics on L-theanine and then you'd see trends being like, L-theanine give me depression. And you're like, I don't think L-theanine gave you depression. <laughs> but it's very, very important just to try and look at either people who are really objective, you know, people like Alex Kekel. Uh, there was a dude I was watching recently who's quite good. He's been on someone like Vigor Steve, for example. Just try and look at people who look at the research, have a good understanding of the biochemistry, and then try and make a, an informed decision based off that. But don't go look at, like, experience trends or how people feel about it because... You know, there's a, a certain filtering process going on there with a lot of those things. And you'll see people who will have issues and they're desperate to find something. And then they'll look for any particular symptom caused by anything new they might have taken or something like that. So in terms of l you know, it has a job. It does a particular thing. And then if it fits that job, then it's great. And if it doesn't fit that job, it doesn't do the job. You know, it's kind of as simple as that. But finding obviously the right thing can be a little bit difficult. That's not to say nootropics and supplements don't have particular side effects for people or whatever, but you know, they're not as they're a bit more benign than people sometimes make them out to be if you read those particular kind of treads. Yeah, I, I'll just add something at the end of that and very much on the same kind of air of what Owen was saying. A lot of time people will hear about people taking certain supplements, and this particularly happens with stimulants and pre-workouts more than any other kind of genre of supplements. But they'll hear about something and they'll be like, oh, this pre-workout has beta alanine in it. So I think I'm going to start taking beta alanine. I wouldn't necessarily come at a come to supplements from a what can I possibly what added advantage am I going to get from that supplement? Because to be honest, a lot of them, as Owen was saying, are a bit more benign. But what I would say is if you're coming into the supplement world, start looking at the individual issues you might have. So if it's a concentration or focus issue, if it's a lactic acid buffering issue, uh, whatever that direct issue is, and then go look at the information around that direct thing rather than hearing about a supplement or seeing a supplement or maybe seeing a supplement added into a, a blend and saying, oh, th maybe this is the one for me. I would very much come at it from a kind of needs approach and say, I need to do this thing. Let me look up some information around this. And there is so much great information, not only on YouTube, but on even some of the forums, um, even on Broderick Chavez's uh, subscription site. There's some amazing articles up there, some very, very well-informed and well-written pieces that will give you a lot of valuable information on that. And definitely come at it from the point of view where you have a particular issue that you need to fix for your performance, whatever that might be, and then start looking at the supplement approach you might be able to take or the training approach you might be able to take. So very much a needs-based approach rather than so kind of an additive process, rather than looking at what are the supplements I could be taking right now and then trying to take everything. Hmm. Uh, and this is coming from someone who's taken a lot of different supplements now. Aubrey Emmett says, what do you lads think the sickest bumper plates are? And you have the best bumper plate in this list. So the list is 2009 Goyang plates, the Chinese logo DHS comp plates, or number three, the black ZKC KG bumpers. And number three is the best bumper plate in the world. Yeah, the black ZKC kg bumpers all black so they used to have white writing on them but obviously that would have wiped off and they are and wore the best bumper plates uh, maybe maybe the old school Alico training bumpers in a close second but they don't really make them like that anymore so they're just like mostly black but they don't do that they just seem to sell the regular plates now he's Delazini says, what's your projected timeline for completing the five and a mile and 500 pounds squat challenge? Probably August of this year. Uh, so I'm finishing off the first block now and um, first block of, of kind of training or in the last two weeks of it and then getting into the second block and then the third block. So it is uh, these timelines take a long time. Uh, a lot of the training. It's funny. We were talking about who was talking about rinsing and repeating earlier in a video. Um, in, in a video we were we were recording, talk about a lot of training being basically rinse and repeat. Uh, but it's very much that way with most training. Like most of my sessions or a lot of my training vlogs for the last few weeks, 
it's just the same thing over and over and over again. It's squats and it's runs and all the runs are basically the same or very, very similar. You'll have some uh, difference in the sessions between the weeks, but from week to week, those sessions are almost identical. And then uh, you'll see as I go into the second training block now, sessions will get slightly different. There'll be a slightly different focus in the sessions, but everything will remain pretty much similar for most of the nine months of training. Hmm, Lico have a performance weightlifting bar that's to 779 euro nice alex Arquette is that says, nice Sarah, though? they are nice barbells is that nice? nice is that is that really nice nice sold individually as opposed to a pair you just cut alex arquila off there and he was saying good afternoon to you cut you off good afternoon alex dd says hi can i train legs twice a week one session five by five squats and one session three to 12 or 15 can i can I answer a question? You can answer. Or do you want to keep talking? Like, well, if you just has everyone to... noticed this, how much he always just keeps talking all the time? Like every video we make, he's always talking. As it, I just want to see if anyone else has noticed this. Do you want to just keep looking up online shopping stuff there? Um, someone's got to look it up. <laughs> so basically, Didi, this is possibly the most common question we will ever get, and most strength coaches and SNC coaches and will ever have is. Can I do this workout? And the answer to the question is, and I totally understand what you're coming to, the first answer and the kind of denying answer is like, yeah, you can do that, but is that the most productive thing? And the answer is in some ways, no, it's not. So there's a minimum level of complexity you need to have in your training when it comes to your programming and your workout progression. And repeating the same workout without any thought process for moving the weight when you're going to do singles, when you're going to start doing doubles, um, you you're just you need to have a minimum level of kind of complexity it's not super complex it's not in crazy difficult it's not you know any kind of rocket science or anything like that but it is something that requires a little bit more thought process and a bit of planning and a trajectory to move on so the answer is like could you do that yes but you need to be um you need to be a little bit more nuanced with your progression and how you're moving you know you need to start doing the triples if you want to hit a single you need to drop the volume we can't be doing medium and high volume at the same time if you realistically want to progress you know they need to be moving with each other the volume needs to be dropping the intensity needs to be increasing and this uh repeating that same workout week on week out totally understandable question but unfortunately isn't it's not the way really uh, Isaac just says he feels bad for me because you're always trying to shut me down. But you just never stop talking. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Dara Miller, great first name. Oh, is this your alternate account? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Dara is my favorite. <laughs> Afternoon, lads. Day one of most weeks of weightlifting 2.0 has clean and jerks in brackets two plus two. Is this intended to as two singles or two cleans and then two jerks? Does it even matter? So, firstly, it does matter. It definitely matters hugely. Anytime you see reps being described as two plus two, it's two cleans and then two jerks afterwards. What you would see in the case of a clean jerk, clean uh, jerk, so two clean and jerks following each other, will be a number of sets multiplied by two. In the same way, if we wanted you to do three cleans and then three jerks it will be three plus three and if we wanted you to do clean and jerk clean and jerk clean and jerk it'll be a number of sets by three so anytime that's the kind of general naming uh nomenclature uh or nomenclature for the for the weightlifting complexes in the same way where if you've got um one pull plus one clean it'll be one plus one if we want you to do two cleans or sorry, two pulls and then one clean, it would be two plus one. And it definitely does matter. The Ginji G said, Hey lads, focusing on upper body strength and size at the moment, two sessions a week uh, for pushing. I do dip and dips and press after pressing. However, it's hard to dip, do dips and vice versa recommendations. So focusing on upper body strength and size at the moment, two sessions a week for pushing. I do dips and press after pressing however it's hard to do dips and vice versa so um so if you're if you're looking for progression so you're looking for upper body strength primarily so the idea here is like what is the goal for that strength you know and what is the goal for the particular lift so like is a are you pushing the dips and the pressing so that you could be stronger for wrestling or for judo or, or something like that or are you doing the pressing for 
you just want to have an upper stronger upper body and these specific lifts are the ones you want to push so the idea there then is that if you're doing two sessions a week and you're doing dipping and pressing um just have one the priority one day and one the priority the other day now you probably could be looking at you know do you necessarily need to be dipping twice a week or pressing twice a week and it depends on what you're doing so the idea here is just pretty simple is just make one session the priority so one day dips comes first and then pressing comes second and then the second day then dips comes first and pressing comes second or vice versa of whatever it is so it's not uh, it doesn't need to be too complicated so you get each day then or each lift gets a priority based on what day it's training and then you can push hopefully both of them pretty equally ian young says yo guys pans matches in exactly one week blue belt masters too lightweight nice so what kind of lifting stroke bjj sessions should i do this week so when you're one week out most of the lifting sessions can basically go away if you have some very specific prehab work so maybe there's certain exercises you do that makes your knee feel much more stable or that allows your shoulder to be more mobile or more effective uh, then you keep doing those things these are really low impact prehab and very specific exercises that they're kind of keeping the wheels on making sure nothing gets uh, loose or nothing gets degraded within the course of that week mostly speaking though this is a taper week so what we typically see in taper weeks is we see volume being drastically decreased and intensity being kept at race pace or intensity being kept up at high near competition levels now, the difficult thing with BJJ or combat sports or contact sports, generally speaking, is that intensity generally means a continue <laughs> generally means a higher risk of injury or a higher risk of something bad happen. So you can't have rugby players smashing each other for the entire week beforehand in the same way where you can't be going to the to the well every single time you're doing a round with somebody for the next kind of three or four BJJ sessions. In this case, what I would say, though, is you should be looking at near competition intensity, but lower volume overall. So if you have a session coming up, you still want to be rolling well. You should obviously really select your training partners for the next week very well. Make sure there's no risk of injury. Make sure it's not somebody who's going to try and absolutely murder you in those sessions. Make sure they're well aware of what you're trying to do. You're well aware of what they're trying to do. Even having a conversation with someone beforehand just saying these are my three kind of points I really want to work on today uh, and that's a that's a great way of going about it also you should be trying to match your your competition ones I assume if you're masters two blue belts your five minute matches uh, at pans and so in that case you should be doing your five minute rounds maybe you just have two or three training partners for a week picked out they're fully aware of what you're trying to do what you're trying to express during those rounds now there's other things could be really valuable some really specific drilling or really specific positional sparring could be very beneficial as well if there's one area of your game you really want to focus on or you really want to capitalize for that competition you should be doing that during the week just a few times or if there's particular areas you need to work on maybe a little weakness you and your coach has found maybe you could work on that with some specific drilling um, but besides that, all the hay has been gathered into the barn. You need to make sure you just hold on to that and you don't ruin anything in the last week. Nothing wrong as well with just not doing any gym work the week of. That's mostly the recommendation for uh, for a lot of athletes and BJJs. Like that, the week of strength training, like unless there was talking about that specific rehab stuff. But if that's the case, there's nothing you're going to gain that week of gym work realistically. You know, BJJ, let that be the prime driver in the week of training and then uh let the gym training resume post that skate says quit rc around stelly said good day lads will the top three totals in the one or two class be uh will we get a 420 plus i i think the winner is going to do something around 190 to 30 ish i could see i think it's going to be akbar to be honest uh i don't i don't know if miso has the snatch and the clean and jerk in him. Now, obviously, I'm rooting for Miso. He's the number one fave here at Sikistan for the 102 class. But I don't know if he'll be able to move that snatch. And the snatch seems to be going really well. I think the next Olympics will probably be his prime in terms of those lifts and moving into the class, you know. But I think Akbar certainly has a clean and jerk in him. Definitely has the snatches in, in him. You know, he's a very, very good snatcher. So if Lee Huan Wah or Giga Chad goes 
I don't think he's going to have that 190 snatch in him. I think he'll have close to it. Obviously, you've seen him do that 185, I think, and a clean and jerk. But I think Akbar is the most rounded of those two. So I reckon it'll probably be around 420, but I don't know if it'll be much more than that. It, you know, the thing with the Olympics is very often the classes are let down. You know, it's, it's a shame to say it, but yeah, a lot of times, like we'd, you know, let's say the 96 class at the Olympics, Miso won that fairly casually, and there was a lot of people who we thought would do great that didn't have a great competition day, and it's just hard to bring it on the day of the Olympics. <laughs> it's, it's tough out there for them, and there's obviously different political yeah. conditions going on. I actually feel weightlifting is very unique in terms of the Olympic sports, where You'll see, you will see some world records. We probably won't see the best snatch and clean and jerk that that lifter is ever going to do being done at the Olympic. Unless you're Gabriel. Unless you're Gabriel. Unless you're Gabriel. Like, it's very, very rare. Most of the time, and why sometimes it can be anticlimactic or it can be somewhat of a letdown, is because we'll see these lifters doing massive weights and training. Particularly, we'll see them doing massive snatch or massive clean and jerk in separate sessions, maybe in different training cycles. And rarely will that absolute one or M be hit on the competition stage at the Olympics. In many, many other sports, people's best performance they'll ever hit will be on the Olympic track or on a court at the Olympics or on the Olympic field, whatever it is. They will do the best performance you likely ever see from them at that competition or at one of the Olympics they'll attend. And it is, it's just a small bit of a contrast here. Now that's due to a host of reasons. Um, one of the reasons being we don't see most other sports putting up their best numbers, uh, putting up their training lifts. We don't see it commonly. Uh, most of that is behind closed doors. Most of that isn't in competition settings. So we might see them in phenomenal power production shape uh but they mightn't be in the best throwing shape they could possibly be in or they might have great strength numbers but they mightn't be in the best sprinting shape they could possibly be in so it is a bit of a contrast weightlifting is a bit of a kind of unicorn in terms of that you definitely get it in certain other sports as well but weightlifting particularly we'll see athletes going to win an olympic medal with a total that's probably a combined 10 kilos under their best snatch and clean and jerk, or even in some case, 20 kilos under their best snatch and clean and jerk. But it's all about winning that event on the day. Uh, Garth talked about the three M's of international weightlifting being medals, 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 and it matters massively. Most sports aren't as objective as weightlifting. Most sports aren't as clear. Like in weightlifting, we see a one kilo difference. and That one kilo is incredibly obvious. Most sports aren't like that. Metal, metal. Dr. Gamer Affleck said, yes, it is the Gold Cup. Len Ken said, in reference to running and strength training video released yesterday, can the same principle be applied to a combat athlete during a block heavily focused on increasing aerobic capacity? Yeah, so it's, it's largely quite similar. In-season stuff is more similar than different for a large grouping of sports. So for a combat athlete and the running athlete, it's going to be pretty similar. The weights... You know, again, it's going to depend on how fast they're moving, how fresh you're feeling, how well the off-season went. The problem with both the runners and the combat sports at least can actually be grouped into this is that you probably didn't take a really meaningful off-season. And it's very, very common until you get to the kind of the pro level where we'll have combat athletes just not taking time out of training. So the funny thing is for combat athletes at the elite level, you know, we're talking Bellator, UFC, one championships, all that stuff is that, you know, they go so hard in the camp and then they take so much time off, some of them, whereas you need to keep your hand in it. A lot of times you'll see amateur combat athletes will never really have an off season. And so rather than us having this huge pool of resources to draw from in your off season where you build up a lot of strength and muscle mass and you build up a lot of, you know, capacity to make power in this in season, you've possibly been working off a very, labored training block you've probably been pretty tired and so for this in season you're deteriorating quite quickly uh, across an already low standard is something we see quite frequently so i would say 
in this case, isn't the workouts or the, the training sessions will be pretty similar. Obviously, there's more nuance and more sessions to be done, but that's probably a pretty good example of what that might look like. And the workout itself is a good example or kind of a reasonable template for one of your sessions to move through. But it's very, very important to understand that it's based off of you've had a good off season or as good as you could possibly have based on variables like injury and your sport and how much time you got off. But it is important to understand that it's not a building phase, you know, and it's slowing down the decay of your performance that you made in the off season. So I would say just as a combat at least make sure that if you're doing a big aerobic phase, either have a strong phase planned after probably before, but make sure that at some point you've given yourself an opportunity to be in the off season. I was reading ahead there and last where we are in the stream. Uh, Henny Visser uh, with a with a donation. Thanks very much for that, Henny. Super chat. Hi lads, I do tug of war for a sport. We do a lot of weight stroke water cutting for weigh ins before camp. I struggle to build muscle while doing that. So this is difficult. This is difficult, particularly if you do multiple competitions per year or the gap uh, between your competitions is very, very short. So you'll see this with combat athletes as well, where they're basically consistently cutting weight. And in those cases, we blur the lines between weight cutting and between water weight cutting. So in the case of a strength and power sport, water cutting is incredibly effective. We get to drop maybe up to 10% of our body weight quite quickly. We can then replenish a massive amount of that weight quite effectively as long as we have about two to three hours before we have to compete. And in those cases, those water cuts aren't massively uh, problematic in terms of you gaining strength, gaining size, or continuing to gain strength and size over the course of your career. What happens, though, when we start bleeding into the realms of cutting weight and doing a water cut is you'll be loading water over the course of a week prior to the competition. You'll be increasing your water intake uh, for all the positive benefits of increasing that natural diuretic hormone, prepping your body to shed all of that water in the 24 hours prior to weighing in. But you'll also have some calorie restriction going on. So even in the case where you might have a nutrition coach and a nutrition coach might be bringing you through all your calories, even in those cases where you're still matching calories, you're still having quite good nutritional intakes, in the week prior to the competition, you're probably doing things like limiting salt and carbohydrate intake to make sure you're not holding a massive amount of water or holding a massive amount of glycogen. Because of that, then we start seeing these issues. So what I would say is if you're just doing pure water cutting and you're not doing it too frequently or the gaps in between the competitions aren't too small, then you can continue to gain weight quite beneficially. But if you're doing things like restricting calories or even altering your macronutrient intake to restrict carbohydrates in the weeks previous to those competitions every time, then you are going to have a problem. In that case, in my opinion, you're better off lowering your consistent body mass. So say if you walk around at 100 kilos and you want to weigh in at 92 and you're constantly having to do these cuts, I would think you're much better off, or in my opinion, you're much better off walking around at 95 or 96, making that cut less severe, that slope of the line levels out a small bit and you can make it purely just water cutting, no restriction of calories in the week pre-weighing pre in. And this will allow you to be more effective with your strength work, more effective with your hypertrophy work, and you'll probably have a bit better of a body composition because of that as well. Uh, Andrew Resident Shore said, good afternoon, Kings. Uh, don't call Derek King. He's nice to learn that. Hope you're both well. Have you earned that? Well, one of us achieved our goal last year and one of us didn't. So more great. It wasn't this. actually last year. It was two years. Two ago. years ago. Yeah. Um, September. You look skinny already. I feel fat and heavy you're gonna be skinnier <laughs> should be attempting front squats later surely 200 andrew and have to imagine andrew, come on 200 for a couple of reps i think uh he said another question what are your recommendations for strength and power training if you're short on time this doesn't affect me personally just didn't see what you'd suggest or based on my own opinion so jumping is super super easy like you can get two different styles of jumps done within 10 or 15 minutes 15 minutes say reasonable training so if you compared are you paired a plyometric movement then with maybe something speed strength or 
to be honest, there's nothing wrong with back squats. Jumping in back squats will cover a lot of your bases. Um, maybe jumping in a Olympic lifts and jumping in jumping or and or squatting back squats. I think you can get. If you can't get that done in half an hour, what can you get done in a half an hour? Yeah, definitely. I think bang for your buck, those plyos are are phenomenally good. The other thing I would say is that as power athletes, people tend to be a small bit, not lazy, but they tend to be a small bit lackadaisical in their sessions. So they'll go into the gym and they'll be taking a lot of time in between sets. They won't necessarily be timing their recoveries because as we always say, you want to be fully recovered. You want to be feeling great before you go and hit that next set because the next set must be as fast and as strong and as powerful as possible. If you're stuck on time though, the best thing you do is take two minutes at the start of the session. You write out all your exercises, your sets and reps, and then you put in an allocated time with them. So actually in some of my training vlogs from last year where I was doing the strength and power work for jujitsu, I'd sit down at the start, I'd write out minute zero to minute six is going to be warm up and, and those jumps. Then in minute seven to minute 17 is going to be my squats or my power cleans. Minute 18 to minute 28 is going to be this. And then you stick to that as best you possibly can. If you're going on to your fifth set and you only have 30 seconds left, then you might just have to cut that fifth set off. Or alternatively, if you've really dragged on for the first half of the session, then you need to cut those rest times down. Not everything, uh, like a lot of us expect our heart rate to be fully back down, fully recovered, almost at homeostasis by the time we're going into the next set. That is not necessarily the way you need to be. Of course, you need to be recovered. Of course, you want to have replenished that ATP that you've just used up. But that doesn't take as long as people typically think it takes. So just writing out that list, maybe it's 45 minutes for a session, maybe it's 60 minutes for a session, but being as strict as you possibly can for that will be massively beneficial. Uh, Eaton Proctor said, what's up, boys? I'm a Canadian mate after moving to Ireland next year for my studies. What are some recognizable weightlifting gyms? That really depends where you're going to study, Ethan. Uh, if you're studying in Dublin, I definitely... I, do UCD still have a weightlifting team, or is that DCU? That was DCU. Oh, what should I? I don't remember, actually. I think DCU have a weightlifting team currently there, so definitely I just re recommend doing that. If not, though, definitely Capital Strength in Dublin. Phenomenal place to go and train. One of the coolest gyms you're going to see in Dublin. If you're in Dublin as well, I definitely go and recommend trying to get into the Herks which is, is it Hercules Weightlifting Club or Hercules Lifting Club? Yeah, Hercules Club, I think. Just to see it, it's like a museum of strength training. Uh, it's the OG spot for lifting weights in Ireland. If you're down south and if you're in Cork, then I definitely recommend Cork Weightlifting Club. Good group of, of weightlifters training there. You'll be training with weightlifters all the time, so that would definitely be my recommendation. Comrade Coolio said, return to weightlifting after the RJ. Are the programs in the app you recommend to bear for a full weightlifting block? Is return to weightlifting on the app? Return to weightlifting is on the app. If not, it will be active in the next couple of weeks. The other option for you here is to go into the weightlifting 2.0 stream, or I think it's just up as the weightlifting stream on the app. What that does, is it basically brings you from the point of starting a weightlifting block from the from the baseline. So Return to Weightlifting was written uh, as people came back from lockdowns and things like that, and people hadn't really been to the gym in a while. In your case, you're coming at the point where you just haven't been doing the weightlifting specific movements all that much. And so starting off on the block one will be a very, very good option for you. You still have a lot of strength development there. Your power hasn't gone away at all. You will be able to step in on the ground floor there. So it is a question of how out of shape are you? How far from the lifts have you gotten? Um, but either of those will be two very, very good options. Yeah, you could run the weightlifting on the app but just use really good representations of your current max on the app so for you know get a reasonable idea and then work through it and then even if it's a little bit lighter than it might need to be that's not a major problem if you're like getting back into weightlifting it's always best to string out the weightlifting the worst thing you want to do is go too heavy too early if you're coming back to it you're going to mess up your technique heavy weights that shouldn't feel heavy you're going to feel super heavy you're going to knock your confidence a lot of different things is uh, so you low and slow for weight of things is very important if you're getting back to it. 
Unmech says, hi lads, I just snatched 107 kilos on Monday. Nice, well done. But my power snatch is around 85 to 87 kilos. Is it a problem to have this much difference uh, for my snatch and power snatch? My immediate thing here is how does the 107 look? If the 107 is crisp, if there's no massive breakdown, if it's not a kind of Hail Mary attempt, then it's not a massive issue. Where some issues can occur, and this is more for lighter weight class athletes or very mobile athletes, is they won't necessarily have the strength of power numbers, but they'll yeet themselves underneath the bar. And then that 107 becomes a somewhat inconsistent uh, or like the Hail Mary thing I called it earlier, where you definitely made it. It was a good lift, but it mightn't be that repeatable every time. In that case, then having a bit more strength and a bit more power would certainly be beneficial. I probably wouldn't look at developing that strength and power through the medium of the power snatch. I probably would look at that just bigger squats, bigger pulls, being stronger, more powerful generally. But if your 107 is nice, if you're happy with the technique you're using, if it's crisp, if it's repeatable, then everything is good. Don't worry about it too much. That power snatch will increase with time. But if the 107 is a bit of a Hail Mary, then that might be a, a kind of noteworthy point. There might be something to pay attention to. Yeah, as a, I wouldn't call you a beginner, but maybe an intermediate lifter, they, those powers to power clean or power snatch ratio to full snatch or full clean can be a little bit wacky. And it doesn't really matter, you know, as long as your snatch 1RM and your clean 1RM are going up. Stuart said, just finished week eight of becoming a horse, but 10 kilos in my squat after long pull Oh, thanks, that. That's great. Nice. That's really great to see lots of people making squat PBs on it. Mm, Kaiser 306 is, hi, guys. Do you recommend behind the neck work for shoulder health to counter the internal rotation from combat, contact sports? No. Well, it's not that we wouldn't recommend behind the neck work, but the answer is it's not the go-to solution. Is probably a better way of putting that. So mobility, obviously strength training, specific work for overhead so moving through weighted movements if needed you know like play pullovers or something like that but i'd be looking at specific mobility for work first and foremost here and then seeing after what needs to be adjusted so you know barbell hangs chin up hangs thoracic mobility thoracic rotations soft tissue work on your lats on your pecs on your bicep on your shoulders on your trap on your neck band this band resisted or band distracted stretches all incredibly useful plenty of soft tissue work would be the go-to initially restoring that range of motion first unweighted then doing some strength work in this new range of motion is kind of the next step after that it might happen really quickly or it might take a while it depends on how bad the internal rotation is how bad the is there pain is there really restricted overhead position so all of that really matters first and the go-to then is like the specific mobility work so i wouldn't be using behind the neck pressing as a kind of surgical tool to use where you're like okay i'm gonna get rid of all the time spent in internal rotation the, the problem is here is that if you're severely internally rotated going doing a load of strict press behind the neck won't be comfortable it'll probably inflame some amounts of tissue the tendon insertion below the elbow there is very very prone to inflammation you know if you're doing a lot of whatever combat sport you're doing whatever it is or contact sport you're doing it's probably already inflamed if you're pushing people if you're pulling people in if you're handing off people it's very susceptible to inflammation and it's very very annoying if it gets inflamed so doing a you know a huge amount of internal rotation or doing a huge amount of behind the neck pressing stuff isn't going to really help if you are already very very restricted so it's got to be mobility first and then seeing what might be make sense what might make sense next banana bread with the accompanying emoji of bananas and bread after it says question regarding necessity of muscle volume muscle mass great benefit for judo etc but what about sports like baseball ichiro skinny but throws hard and hits home runs is there a need for bodybuilding balloon muscle so this is a really, really interesting thing. Baseball has it. Sprinting has it. A lot of the track and field sports have it, where you get some athletes who are phenomenally powerful, very, very fast in their given... Very power. Very power. Very fast in their given uh, silo, but they don't necessarily look like they're incredibly strong or hold a lot of muscle mass. Now, it's certainly true where you can get somebody to swing a bat 
throw a ball, swing a golf club incredibly fast with a massive amount of power with not that much muscle mass. And when we look at that muscle mass, we're probably going to see a very high degree of fast twitch muscle fiber. We'll probably see very well-developed muscle tendon relationships and tendon strength there. So they're loading up incredibly well. In those cases as well, they're probably using an incredible amount of lower body power. So you might see someone who's actually quite skinny and slender in their upper body, but their upper body is simply just a conduit to transfer all that power, whether it be a punch, a throw, a swing, whatever it is. In those cases, when we see that relationship, we see, okay, they're quite skinny and they don't hold a lot of muscle. How are they so fast? Or should I be emulating that to be so fast? We're kind of missing the wood for the trees here. So the amount of power we generate is dictated to a certain extent or has an influence by the amount of muscle mass we hold. More muscle can lead to can lead to greater levels of strength, and that strength can lead to greater levels of power output and speed eventually. But what you need to look at here, firstly, is why do certain people, or why do, generally speaking, power athletes want more muscle? And that usually is to maintain those structures, maintain those positions without as much of a risk of injury. So in the case of a baseball player, shoulder surgeries are just everywhere. It's synonymous. It's like a rugby player. Everybody's going to do their shoulder. And when we hold a bit more muscle mass and muscle tissue around those joints through doing that kind of bodybuilding stuff, we are going to have a small bit more of a cushion there and not cushion in terms of an actual physical cushion, but a cushion there. So we have more muscle tissue, more muscle tissue binding to that tendon tissue. And then we have a bit of a sink into which we can draw in terms of preventing a bit more injury or being a bit more resilient to injuries occurring. So I wouldn't necessarily look at people and being very skinny and very light and say, oh, they can still be very fast, so I don't need to be that way. There's a lot more going on here in terms of neurological inputs, in terms of our, our skill and technique of throwing, in terms of our tendon and ligament strength and how well we can load those tendons to absorb that force and then shoot that force all out at one time. So it is, it's definitely a valid question. It's definitely something we see across multiple sports, but it's not necessarily something that if you were a youth athlete, you would ever want to hold them back from building muscle. That muscle is going to be beneficial to them. It will raise the eventual ceiling of what they'll be able to achieve, but also it should make them a small bit more robust to be able to train a bit more, develop a bit more skill, and then have a better career because of that. SC said, what are your opinions on cannabis with regards to affecting training, performance, or just health in general? Thanks. So pretty interesting question. If you look at the research initially, and this has come up kind of fairly regularly when the comments or questions we get a lot, the research generally shows if you're going to see a negative impact on performance, it usually comes to faster to fatigue. So either anaerobic or aerobic. So usually they're looking at wind gate tests or something like that. And Sometimes they'll find a statistically significant effect and sometimes they'll find a trend towards that, but not statistically significant in terms of male or female. The effect seems to be quite similar. So it kind of depends on what they're testing, how many people are testing, how much weed they're smoking is probably the real change there. So in regards to performance, it seems to trend towards the negative. So that's going to come in where you're balancing your lifestyle decisions how much you enjoy smoking weed what you get from smoking weed how important training is to you so if someone is like look i want to maximize absolutely everything i'm doing for training then should smoking weed be part of that and the answer would be no so i would definitely be hedging my bets and not smoking marijuana or cannabis or whatever phrase you use for it if you're looking for ultimate performance trying to maximize everything available to you in your life uh, so in regards to general health in regards to your impact, obviously smoking anything is generally poor for health. It depends on what you're smoking, where the weed is coming from. Uh, there's very little benefit in regards to the actual smoking of something. So inhibit or intake of THC or, or you know related products may or may not be useful for certain conditions. Uh, it does seem to be a trend in higher inflammation in terms of C-reactive protein for people who smoke habitually which is generally a good predictor, not a good predictor, a, a good correlator, I suppose, of cardiovascular disease. That's not good anything about it, but it is a useful marker to measure. Oh, the last thing then as well, I think, is something 
in regards to health in general, if you're asking the question, I don't know any or very many that I can think of habitual marijuana users who are in a a good place, for want of a better word, who are in a position where everything is going swell. I know people who smoke weed like once a year, every so often, but most of the time, and I'm not blaming marijuana or cannabis for this. I'm just saying that I don't not say it's carp for the horse. Is it a fact that these people go towards marijuana as the solution, which I definitely seen sometimes, or is it something that began because of smoking weed? Now, firstly, just in case anyone listening, I'm all for people being able to do whatever they want and put whatever they want in their bodies. I'm not sure what the name of that particular person is in terms of their views, but I am one of those people. I am all a libertarian. Is it a libertarian? That I, seems all I encompassing. No I don't think that's it's whatever it is that you can do, as long as it doesn't harm anyone else, I'm all for you being able to get, educate yourself and do whatever you want with your own body. I am, if you can get the product you're supposed to get and it's well regulated and you can put it in your body and you get what you're buying for, that's what I'm a big fan of. So I don't think anyone shouldn't be allowed to smoke weed. I'm just saying it doesn't seem from the people I know, from the small group of people I know, when they smoke weed habitually, there seems to be a corresponding level of problems and I'm not saying weed caused that, but weed doesn't seem to be assisting in solving those problems. Uh, so in general health seems to be some stuff. Now I know for a long time there, up until a few years ago, we were seeing, you know, marijuana or weed being like the be all and end all and cure for everything. There does seem to be some legitimate uses for marijuana, but in general for training, I don't like to see it uh, regular. It certainly doesn't assist in training in any manner, you know, and there's a lot of thought around this impact on your sleep, which I think will probably evolve a bit more over years. But in general, I don't think marijuana is super beneficial unless you have a very specific solution to it. Which sounds like I hate people who smoke marijuana or smoking marijuana, but I actually would be more than happy for anyone to do what you wanted in that regard. I have no problem, but it seems the question was asked. Chris says, hey guys, what cues or movements can I work on to stop dropping the bear at the bottom of snatches? Tom Miller said, Thatcher type. <laughs> Thatcher. Oh, definitely uh, isn't that Tom. There he is. There we go. Not sure. Uh, so he says, drop out, stop dropping the bear in the bottom of a snatch. Not sure if it's low back getting loose or bad head positioning. I get under the bear and the shoulders roll forward. So there's a couple of things here. The first thing is my oh, number one cue for this is being a hell of a lot more active with the legs, with the feet, and with the hips when we go to catch the bear in the snatch. We talked earlier about people kind of yeeting themselves underneath the bear and just slamming into that bottom position. I really don't like that. I really don't think most weightlifters should train like that. I think you should be aiming to catch the bear as close to parallel as possible, aiming to put the brakes on as aggressively as possible, and then any sinking under that happens has to happen because of that. Most of the time I see this issue, particularly with the shoulders rolling forward in the bottom, People yeet themselves underneath the bar. Usually their weight is too far back. Their hips are too low and they're in no way active. I like people to be slamming their feet into the floor as active as possible with their quads and with their glutes in the catch position and really driving up into the bar when they catch the bar. In my opinion, the best person to watch for this, if you want to see what I'm talking about, is Gabriel Sincrain or Lordana Toma is another great example on the female side. Very, very active and very strong in the catch position. And this tends to stop that error from happening. Now, a secondary thing that comes along with that, a lot of time people just don't have that strength overhead. And so strict pressing, strict pressing behind the neck, snatch grip, strict pressing, snatch grip, push pressing, and snatch balances. Snatch, <laughs> snatch balances are all so beneficial here but the first thing you should be doing is the actual technical thing of making sure you're being active in that catch position okay we gotta go thanks very much guys we'll talk to you all again soon if you've urgent questions seek a strength at gmail.com as always if you want to see what any of our programs look like go on to the app you can start a free trial you don't have to pay anything just download the app you can look at the programs see what they look like download a few of them put in your numbers and you'll get a first person view of what those programs will look like for you.